are recording. Praise God. Blessings, 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 beloved. I am Mama Pam, a.k.a. Pamela Dobson, and I do read, beloved, seven minutes every day so you don't have to read. Today's read, we are resuming our read on the commentary from what we read earlier today. Uh, today is Friday, December the 23rd, 2022, my daughter's 51st birthday. I honor her. I honor her life. She was born 51 years ago today, and I thank God for that. Uh, we're reading 1 Samuel, the second chapter, commentary on the ninth verses, uh, and we will read the entire commentary of 1 Samuel. Praise God. And it reads, we're reading from EnduringWord.com. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength no man shall prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. From heaven he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's. Now Hananiah was confident in God's ability to humble the strong and exalt the weak because God is in control. If God were not in control, then perhaps the strong could do what they wanted and God couldn't stop them. But Hannah knew that the foundation of the earth itself, the pillars of the earth, belong to the Lord. For by strength no man shall prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. God uses his power to set things right. It isn't enough for us to believe God has this power. We must know he will use it for his glory and righteousness. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. At this time, Israel did not have a king and didn't seem to want one. So when Hannah spoke of his king, she looked ahead to the Messiah, who will finally set all wrongs right. He is his anointed. Please do no talking, no typing, no communicating while I am reading. Please let the church be silent. Thank you. This is the first place in the Bible where Jesus is referred to as the Messiah. She first applied to, uh, applied to him the remarkable epithet Messiah in Hebrew, Christ in Greek, and anointed in English, which was adopted by David, Nathaniel, Ethan, Isaiah, Daniel, and the succeeding prophets of the Old Testament and by the apostles and inspired writers of the New. Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, quoted Hannah in Luke 1, 6, and 9, when he prophetically called Jesus a horn of salvation. Quoting from 1 Samuel 2 and 10, Mary, the mother of Jesus, quoted Hannah's song often in Luke 1, 46 uh, through 55. Samuel ministers to the Lord. Then Elkanah went to his house at Ramah, but the child ministered to the Lord before Eli the priest. Then Alk and I went. They did it. It was hard to do, to leave this little son behind, but they did it because they promised they would do it. They promised God that they would do it. But the child ministered to the Lord before Eli the priest. Young as he was, Samuel had a ministry to the Lord. Our young people can praise and please God, and it's often a breakthrough in their walk with the Lord when they experience God in worship. The Living Bible translates it well. And the child became the Lord's helper. There are ways that even children can serve God and minister to him. The wicked sons of Eli, the high priest. The evil character of Eli's sons. Now the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. Literally, the ancient Hebrew calls them sons of Belial. Belial was a pagan god, and the phrase sons of Belial refers to worthless and wicked men. This was a significant problem 
because the sons of Eli were in line to succeed him as high priest, and they already function in the priesthood. Thank you, King Lily. Thank you. Thank you for your gifting. They did not know the Lord. Even though their father, Eli, knew the Lord, that knowledge was not passed on genetically to his sons. They had to personally know the Lord for themselves. We must personally know the Lord for ourselves. Like I said, my daughter is 51 years old today. I can't make her know the Lord. I've raised her. I have taught her. She has to seek the Lord for herself. And I'm glad to say that she is a born-again believer. And she does serve the Lord. The same Lord that I serve. Their first offense, stealing what was offered to God. So the priest's custom with the people. With many of the sacrifices brought to the tabernacle, a portion was to be given to God, a portion was to be given to the priest, and a portion was kept by the one who brought the offering. According to the other passages in the Old Testament, the priest received a portion of the breast and the shoulder. But here it is now, some 400 years after the law of Moses came, that the priestly custom changed. They did not take the prescribed portion of the breast and shoulder, but took whatever the fork cook brought up out of the pot. See how we change God's laws? We change God's rules and God's laws, and he put them in place for a reason. Before they burned the fat. So God's portion was always given first. So it was wrong to take the priest's portion before they burned the fat. The fat was thought to be the most luxurious, best part of the animal. So they gave it to God. The idea was that God should always get the best. And God should get his portion first. But in their pride, the sons of Eli took their portion before they burned the fat, before they even God gave God his sacrifice. Thank you, King Lily. Before they even gave uh, God his sacrifice, the sons of Levi wanted to take theirs, and that's not right. He will not take boiled meat from you but raw. So why did the sons of Eli don't want raw meat? Perhaps it was so they could prepare it in any way they pleased, or more likely it was because raw meat was easier to sell and they sold the meat and pocketed the money possibly no but you must give it now and if not I will take it by force so the greed of Eli's sons was so bad that they did not hesitate to use violence and the threat of violence to get what they wanted for men had hoard the offering of the Lord now, the greatness of the sin of Eli's sons was clear because through their greed, violence, and intimidation, they made others not want to come and bring offerings to the Lord. It was bad enough what they themselves did, but the greater sin of Eli's sons was in how they hurt other people. In many churches today, there's so much sin running rampant in the churches. The preachers, the ministers, the deacons, are so corrupt in these buildings until you young people that are here even listening on this platform. Y'all don't go to nobody's church. You're trying to come out of debauchery. You're trying to come out of hell. You're trying to get off of swinging around a pole. You're trying to get out of pimping and hustling. You're trying to get out of prostitution. And then you come into the church house and they're doing the same thing. They want to hustle you and pimp you and prostitute you out of God's house. Devil is a lie. And so that's what they were doing back here. The same type of thing. The exact opposite of what the body of Christ should be doing. But Samuel. So as bad as Eli's sons were, Samuel was different. We can say that this is why God raised up Samuel. Because of the corruption of Eli's sons. God knew how bad Eli's sons were. So he guided the whole series of events that resulted in Samuel's service at the tabernacle. If Eli's sons were not worthy successors, then God would raise up someone else. Don't ever think that you cannot be replaced. Don't let me become so complacent in reading the word of God to you that God can't call for somebody else to come and read if I don't want to. If I'm not faithful and if I'm haughty 
and and, sell, and and stuck on my side. God can get rid of me and call somebody else to read. I ain't the only person, only voice God got in the world. So you, I better stay humble, stay in my place. Amen. Ultimately, corrupt ministers do not stop or even hinder the work of God. That may look like it, but every time there are men like Eli's sons, God will raise up someone like Samuel, like Mama Pam. God's work does not stop when God's ministers become corrupt. He'll find another way. He put me on this platform where y'all can get to church all around the world all the time right here. Or you can go to the U place and find the information right there. Praise God. Wearing a linen ephod. Now, even as a child, Samuel distinguished himself in his service to the Lord. His service was exceptional enough that he received the linen ephod, a priestly garment in Exodus 39, 27, and 29. What did Samuel do? He did small, cha small charges as setting up the lights and laying up the vestments and learning music of the lights. He got a lot of little things around the church, around the building. Even as a child. So though a child, Samuel served the Lord better and in a greater way than the sons of Eli did. What man looks at in the service of God is often not what the Lord is looking at. His mother used to make him a little robe. Only someone who was really there described such a small detail. Though Hannah gave her little boy to the Lord, she never stopped loving him. And the Lord visited Hannah. He certainly did. The Lord visited that old girl in old age. He gave her three more sons and two more daughters. I think she did pretty good, don't y'all? Praise God. God will never be a doubter to any debtor. God will never be a debtor in debt owe you anything to anyone. Hannah could never say to the Lord, I gave you my son, but what did you give me back? Because God gave her so much more in return. The second offense of Eli's sons was sexual immorality. Sexual immorality. Now Eli was very old and he heard everything his sons did to all of Israel and how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting. Now Eli was very old. This passage is not focused on Eli's sons as much as it is on Eli himself. He was old and in no condition to lead Israel's high priest. He heard everything his sons did, but Eli only rebuked them about it. They lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle meeting. This means that the sons of Eli were committing sexual immorality with the women who came to worship at the tabernacle. This was an ancient version of the modern sex scandals among pastors or preachers today. It's impossible that the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle were in some way workers at the house of the Lord. Exodus 38, 8 refers to the serving women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the meetings. The vain and effective rebuke of Eli to his sons. Why do you do such things? It's an unreasonable, it's an, it is an understandable question, but a needless one. It doesn't matter why, because there could be no good reason. They can't excuse their sin. They had to be responsible for it instead. Eli did about the worst thing a parent can do in trying to correct their children. Just talk. All he did was whine about what they did wrong, but he never took the necessary actions to correct the problem. Parents would be better off to yell less, lecture less, and take sensible action more often, letting the children see the consequences for their disobedience. Writing from the 17th century, John Trapp advises Eli on what he should have said. Draw near hither, ye sons of the sorcerers, the seed of the idolater and the whore, 
ye degenerated brood and sons of Belial, and not of Eli, ye brats of phantomous prediction. It is stark stinking not that I hear, and woe is me that ye live to hear it. It hath better that I had died long since, or that you had been buried alive, than thus to live and stink above the ground. You make the Lord's people to transgress. So again, this was the great sin of Eli's son. It was bad enough that they stole and indulged their own lusts, but they also, by their corrupt behavior, made people hate worshiping God with their offerings at the tabernacle. 1 Samuel 2.17, And they led women worshipers into sexual immorality. If one sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? Fortunately, 1 John 2 and 1 answers these eyes questions. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate, an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We thank God that there is someone to intercede for us when we sin against the Lord. Nevertheless, they did not heed the voice of their father because the Lord desired to kill them. Now this striking statement may seem unfair to some. The picture of Eli's sons wanting to repent and listen to their father but God prevented them. This is not the case at all. God judged Eli's sons this way. He gave them exactly what they wanted. They did not want to repent, and God did not work repentance in their hearts. God saw they were corrupt men and wanted to judge them. Now, when the Lord desired to kill them, it simply meant that God desired that Eli's sons be brought to judgment. And the child Samuel grew in stature and favor both with the Lord and men. What a contrast to the wickedness of Eli's sons. This shows that although Eli was far from a perfect father, he was not a chronically bad father because he essentially fathered Samuel and grew him up to be a godly man. The announcement of, judge, of God's judgment against Eli's house. An unknown man of God pronounced judgment to Eli. His family will be cut off from the office of high priest. Then a man of God. Now we don't know who this man was. This man of God is one of the wonderful and anonymous characters of the Bible. But it doesn't matter who he was. He was a man of God. And God raised him up to speak to Eli and Eli's whole family at this important time. Did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father? The father referred to is Aaron, who was the first high priest, since the high priesthood was a hereditary office, Eli was a descendant of Aaron, whom God had revealed himself to. 1 Samuel 2.28 is a wonderful summary of some of the duties of the priesthood in Israel to be my priests. First and foremost, the job of a high priest was to minister to the Lord. Before he served the people, he was a servant of God. He was not just the, the people's priest, he was the first priest of God to offer up on my altar. So the priest brought sacrifices for atonement and worship. To burn incense. Burning incense was a picture of prayer because the smoke and the scent of the incense ascends up to the heavens. The priest was to lead the nation in prayer and to pray for the nation. To wear an ephah before me. The priest was clothed in specific garments for glory and for beauty. Exodus 28 and 2. He was to represent the majesty of dignity, glory, and beauty of God to the people. All the offerings. The priest was also charged with responsibility to receive the offerings of God's people and to make good use of them. Why do you kick at my sacrifice? It would have been easy for Eli to say, I'm not doing it, my sons are. But Eli had a double accountability for his sons, both as a father 
though this was diminished because the sons were adults, and as the high priest. His sons worked for him as a priest, and Eli was a bad boss. And honor your sons more than me. So since Eli did not correct his sons the way he could should, he essentially preferred them to the Lord. If Eli were more afraid of offending God and less afraid of offending his sons, he would have corrected them as he should have. Eric Liddell was one of Britain's great athletes, and later he gave his life for Jesus on the mission field. In 1924, he was to run for Britain in the Olympus, and when it was discovered that the preliminary heats of his best event, the 100 meters, would be run on a Sunday, quietly but firmly, Liddell refused to run. The day of the 400 meters race came, and as Liddell went to the starting blocks, an unknown man slipped a piece of paper in his hand with a quotation from 1 Samuel 2 and 30. Those who honor me, I will honor. That day, Eric Liddell set a world's record in the 400 meters. I will cut off your arm. Not literally, but since the arm was a picture of strength and might in Hebrew thinking, Psalms 10, 15, 70, 15 17, and 15 and 89 and 10, this said, the house of Levi would be left powerless and without strength. I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. Get my blanket and my legs getting cold and a little chilly in here. But now the Lord says, so God promised that the priestly line would not stay with Eli and his descendants, but would pass to another line of descendants from Aaron. This was fulfilled many years later in Solomon's day. Abiathar from Eli, Eli's family, was disposed as high priest and replaced with Zadok, who was from another family. 1 Kings 2.27 reads, So Solomon removed Abiathar from being priest to the Lord, that he might fulfill the word of the Lord which he spoke concerning the house of Eli, at Shiloh. I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, this was a promise to Aaron in passages like Exodus 29 9. God did not remove the priesthood from the line of Aaron, but he did remove it from the line of Eli. There shall not be an old man in your house forever. And all the descendants of your house shall die in the flower of their age. This idea is repeated twice in these few verses. God wanted to emphasize that he would not bless the descendants of Eli with a long life. Shall consume your eyes and grieve your heart. The descendants of Eli, who did live a little longer, would not live blessed lives. Their end would be painful to see. The sign and the promise... Both sons will die on the same day. Now this shall be a sign to you. Since the fulfillment of the judgment would be many years away in the days of Solomon, God gave Eli an immediate sign to demonstrate his truthfulness. Eli's sons will die in one day. Eli will see this and Eli will know the judgment of God has come against his house. Then I will raise up myself a faithful priest. So who is the faithful priest predicted here? He was a great priest because he did according to what is in God's heart and in God's mind. He was a blessed priest because God said of him, I will build him a sure house and he will walk before my anointed forever. This promise was partially fulfilled in Samuel because he functioned as a godly priest, effectively replacing the ungodly sons of Eli. The promise was partially fulfilled in Zadok in the days of Solomon because he replaced Eli's family line in the priesthood. The promise was ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ because he is a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, Hebrews 7, 12, and uh, 17. Everyone is left in your house. Everyone who is left in your house will come 
and bow down to him for a piece of silver. So this is a fitting judgment, since much of the sin of Eli's sons was greed and stealing from God's people. So instead of receiving the priestly portions that were rightfully theirs, Eli's family would one day be reduced to begging, to paupers, to having not sufficiency. Praise God. May the Lord add a blessing to you, the hearer, and me, the reader of this commentary, 1 Samuel, the second chapter about uh, Eli's sinful sons and Samuel beginning to be raised in the priesthood of the Lord. Continue to come in here. Again, this is who we are. We are Smurf Family International Ministry, where I read the Word of God seven minutes every day, so you do not have to read. If the Lord has laid it upon your heart to give a financial blessing, please do. Dollar sign, Mama Pam 23. Dollar sign, Mama Pam 23.